of you may not realise it, but I'm, I, was, I was actually born in England. I'm not Australian. I immigrated to Australia in 1979. And uh, I first got involved in permaculture in 1980. I was uh, 26 years old at that time. If you do a bit of maths, that means I was 16 in 1970 and I lived through the 70s and all its dreams. And uh, when I came across permaculture and I happened to be in Australia just at the right time, it was, it was what I thought was an obvious thing. We were obviously going to do this. I took my course with Bill Mollison in 1983 and I thought this was going to be international policy by 1990. So I got into my own property, my own needs, my own design, my own farm. I did some consulting and I didn't do much else. Well, 1990 came around and things hadn't changed that much. And I kind of had a midlife crisis by choice and decided that I had to jump right over the line and make a full commitment. And I've been pretty well full on ever since and things have only got better and worse at the same time. I'm seeing things get better and I'm seeing things get worse. The potential is there, but there's all kinds of issues happening everywhere, all around us, and there's many, many, many negative things. I mean, we could make, you couldn't, f there wouldn't be any point in making a career out of the negatives that we could see around us. They're here every day, they're on the news, we're in the information age. So, I don't think we need to sell the negative side of things at all because there's a plethora of choices what might be the biggest negative that gets us. Um, we've, we've definitely got some serious issues and the tipping point in a bad direction is not something I would like to experience or would like anyone to experience. Um, I think it, it could be quite horrific actually, and, and a lot of innocent people, especially children, would definitely be suffering. Um, we don't realise how bad it could be. But I think there's always a chance, and there's only one game in town that I know of that's really aiming in the right direction and putting all the right eggs in the right basket. That's probably not the right analogy, but <laughs> um, putting all the right systems together, uh, working out around a design science. We have this incredible technology available to us today and technology and finance and money and these sort of things, they don't scare me at all. It doesn't worry me at all. I think we can use it all and we need probably to use it. Um, and overpopulation doesn't scare me either. I think we need all the people we've got in a positive mode. I think everything, that, that, as negative as we are, we can be as equally positive. Everything I see in the universe around us, everything I see in design, there's no give without take, there's no good without bad, there's no, no plus without a negative. There's, and, and, and we can, we are the resource that can make that change. In fact, we may be the only resource that can make that change. Uh, there are a lot of scientists today that believe that if you took people off the earth, it would still environmentally slide now. So the earth actually needs people. It needs us to go into a mode of operation. It needs us to push that tipping point. And when you look at images of flying over the world and you see our amount of energy use and our electric light images all around us, around populations and our urbanizing population, um, even in quite developing countries, we, we we show our imagery out to the satellites in electric energy use and a lot of inefficient energy use. Um, we're, we're not changing yet, not enough. And we need to set some examples. And one of the best examples could be set here because there's a lot of aspiring to this country's lifestyle wherever you go, no matter where you are. Um, what we have to offer to people is quite an incredible and positive system. It's, like I say, it's really the only game in town. It's the only game worth getting involved in. And it is such a story. It is such an event. 
It covers so many elements. It puts together such an endless set of opportunities. It, it's, it's a system where you actually end up feeling comfortable with positivism. You, that you're comfortable with the infinite possibilities that from the microorganisms of the soil through to the right through to the infinite beauty of the ecosystems. They're all elements that we work with. They're all elements that we extend. Where do we end up? We end up in absolute abundance. An absolute abundance of clean air, an absolute abundance of clean water, an absolute abundance of clean food, an absolute abundance of sensible housing that heats itself, cools itself, and is replaceable and has a low en embodied energy. An absolute abundance of community, warmth, and friendship. All of those things are deficient in what we call the developed and civilized world. Um, it's, what are we about? What, what are we actually about? We're about science and ethics. We're an ethical design science. We start with ethics. Our controlling elements are ethics. Um, we control our scientific approach, our design science approach. We control it with ethics of how we behave, how we integrate ourselves into the living systems of Earth. We look for indicators that are obvious around us of better soils, better biodiversity, moderations of water flows, qualities of water, quali changes even in weather in the long term, moderations. We're a moderating element. We moderate systems. So when we look at pushing a tipping point, when we look at how do we, how do we increase the tipping point potential, what is it that will make a difference to us? We teach uh, and we demonstrate. We, we, we show imagery. I've got thousands of hours of imagery now. Luckily, I realized that we needed to get imagery out there. Bill used to say, if, if we could get per, permaco the permaculture design course on television running 24-7 everywhere, we'd probably get out of trouble. Well, we didn't realize there was going to be a new screen involved and there was going to be computers, laptops, iPads, iPhones, and a, a phenomena called the screenager instead of the teenager. Right? The average screenager spends 60 hours a week in front of a screen of some type. We're kind of locked into the matrix. And when we look at what happens when things collapse, when we look at what happens when we leave industry, it's the natural systems that come back and take back over. It's the plant systems that eventually win, actually. Nature comes back over our industrial systems. And main elements of nature, like water flows, are always present. Energies that are constantly around us, we've moved past. We've moved on to this high-tech industry. And still, water continues to flow everywhere around us. It's endlessly flowing down hill, pulling gravity. Old technologies, which are still more efficient than modern technologies, the overshot water wheel is still the most efficient machine ever made by mankind. That's going back quite a long way, the overshot water wheel. Um, and we've had, we've had those technologies in position, and some, in some places the actual waterways are still in position. Um, but for us, you know, we're giving people all, the, all sorts of different examples. Um, our land-based systems, our animal systems, our, our soil systems, water systems, a whole mix of stuff. We have so many stories to tell. But how do we get them out there on time? How do we get them out there as it's getting more urgent? I read and I read and I, I become obsessed with reading what might make a difference. Um, 
I've, I've literally been obsessed with this subject, the tipping point. I think a lot of us have. How do we speed it up? Um, it's, it's probably the most urgent feeling I have. It's, it's my most urgent desire. It, it, it's what would make me redundant. I would be great. I would love to be redundant. I'm working really hard for my redundancy. I've got no problem with going home. And I've been teaching and teaching and teaching. I've forgotten, I don't know how many courses I've taught. I've lost count. I never was one that was trophy hunting. How many? I never counted. I lost touch of how many countries I've taught in. I don't know, it's 30 something or other, or maybe more. Or, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, luckily, I started to register my students in my address book, and I know I've gone over 6,000 plus at one time. Someone once asked me a question, they said, how many, how many translation courses have you taught? And I just happened to think about it and I realized I taught more translation courses than courses in English at one time. I said, that's weird. I've actually taught more courses through a translator than I have through my own language. That has changed now. But I'm still trying to produce active students. What you need is people to become active. You have to want them to become active. I really wanted to theme that. We're now in universities. We're now, we've got inquiry from the, the young people love this. I mean, they're all over this. This is interesting. This is hopeful. But I've always wondered, is it enough? Is it enough? You know, have I done enough? Have I paid my carbon credits? Really? I mean, I often thought, should I just stay home and put together the ultimate farm that I open it up to the public and open it up to a video, but it'd only be that one landscape and that climate. And I'm, I'm pretty confident I could put together some one hell of a system. And I've stretched instead. I try to do a bit of both, put the farm together and do the aid work and go out there and push those barriers out there as far as I could. It, it got up to over 20 international flights a year. I was more comfortable being jet lagged than not jet lagged. The most familiar places to me were hub airports around the world. I could walk through Bangkok or LA airport or Frankfurt. You know, the hub airports of the world, I, I, it, was my, it was my office. I knew exactly where to go. Dubai, you know. I'm still pretty familiar with a few of them. And the, and the imagery on screen started to come off. It started to like get this effect, this sort of film imagery stuff. The prestige of like getting it out there, like this imagery. And all the stuff we do. And I realized I just had to get it. I, I used to spend thousands of dollars on photographs. I, I, I used to take a, a still photo and a slide photo of everything so I could put a slideshow up. Remember those transparencies? And I used to have a paper photograph, you know, the, and I used to have a, a photo album that I could show students, I could show clients, so I could sell my stuff. I could say, this is what you get with a food forest. This is what it looks like at a certain age. And I, I once felt that it was strange. Bill got funded. Bill Mollison got funded like $5,000 to sort his slideshows out. I thought, that's a crazy amount of money. Like, it seemed to me, I, I, I hate filming Guilty. Afterwards, I realized I was, that was something I shouldn't have thought was a bad thing, because I ended up with 30,000 transparent slides that I definitely needed sorting out. <laughs> and an equal amount of still photographs and they were fading away in photo albums and gradually deteriorating. And by that time, I'd got a digital camera. <laughs> My first digital camera cost me $1,000 in America. It had a floppy disk in it. Remember them? Yeah? yeah? It used to take six photos or one bitmap. And I thought that was so high tech. Right? When I worked on my first aid project, we thought faxes were high tech. That was in the early 90s. 
I had three cameras at one time because I didn't know whether digital was really going to happen. So I used to have three different shots going. Of course, it's all gone digital. It's all on your iPhone. It's all in your apps. No, everything's changed. Everything's easier, really. We can record it like crazy. You've really got no excuse. We can get it out there and, and promote it. We've got urban gardens documented. We've got every gram of product documented. We've, we've got more and more facts out there. We know all this can be done. But still, how do we, how do we push that tipping point? Um, was education going to do it? I mean, were we going to educate enough people that they became teachers and they became teachers and they became teachers? I was really proud to start producing teachers. I asked Bill when I started, how do I know I'm a good teacher? He said, well, a good teacher produces active students. I said, right, okay, that's my theme. I'll go for that. Um, a good teacher produces a teacher within at least 350 to 400 students. I got my first teacher at 125, pretty fast up and teaching. I got great, great grandchildren, great, 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 great grandchildren in the movement who were teaching. Teachers who were students of my students and my students and my students. Probably more in Brazil. They breed pretty fast over there. <laughs> I produce people like this gentleman, Nick Huggins, is, is, runs permaculture business world. He, he, he teaches people how to go into business. We've got people who are out there actually getting permaculture businesses focused out there. We've got landscape, you know, landscapers out there putting permaculture landscapers in. We've got all kinds of active people going on. And I just kept thinking, is it enough? Is it enough? Am I even paying my carbon credits for all those flights? A year ago, for the first time, I signed on Facebook. I never thought I'd sign on Facebook. I used to sort of think that was some crazy thing that other people did that I didn't do and I'd never have time for. But I did it for a social media experiment because I was getting a few ideas about how I could get more people out there. And of all things, when I went on Facebook, things went crazy. People were, em where people were messaging me. I don't even know the right terminology, but I just kept saying yes to everybody. Right? Yes, yes, yes. I quickly got 5,000 friends. Right? I even did a crazy thing. I put my Facebook onto my Skype. So I had 5,000 Skype friends. And they could see me online just to see what the hell would happen. And for a f <laughs> of course, it went nuts. Right? And then I would email people. I would answer everybody. I, would, I had a whole period where I tried to answer everybody who could see me and talk to me on Skype, which was hundreds at a time. And then that would go out through, through the Skype sphere of the world. And people were messaging. And it was coming back. I just talked to Jeff Lawton. Like, wow. You know? And then people started to message me and say, I'm in Mongolia because of you. And I thought, what? You know, I'm in the Welsh Mountains because of you. I saw one of your DVDs. I, I saw one of your, your videos. You know, I followed one of your things. And it kept coming in. People coming in from everywhere. It was crazy. And I said, what the hell have I done? <laughs> you know, and then I was like, yeah, you know what? It was Facebook that made me realize I paid my carbon credits. <laughs> it, it really chilled me out. I thought, yeah, I, I paid. I've got all those people. They were, they were community. I had to cut it down. I had to take some advice on it, and you know, I had to get a, a, a special page and get some, get my daughter to manage it for me, and all that sort of thing. <laughs> I've recently even done Twitter, right, but getting back to reading. It's true that you read so many books just to mine a paragraph. There's so many classics out there, you know, to, to read. As a permaculturist, you mine out paragraphs and chapters. 
even the origin of the species by Darwin is worth the read. You know, it's just, it's classic stuff. But one, re one writer, someone gave me a book called Tipping Point. But this is yours, this is your sort of book. Malcolm Gladwell, he wrote another great book after that called Blink, which relates to neural pathway events as well. But Tipping Point was given to me to read because I was so obsessed with this subject, Tipping Point. How do we push that tipping point? And Gladwell res researched it all, whether it's epidemics, whether it's fashions, whether it's revolutions. Whatever it is, there's something really surprising about tipping points. I thought we had to go over 50% to get to a tipping point. According to the research, you hit the tipping point at about 12 to 18 percent. We need 12 to 18 percent of the population and then we go viral. Then it becomes international policy or national policy. It becomes the normal way to behave. We go past forming. We go past the challenges which is the storming and we go into norming. If you're a teacher, you're always going to go through norming, storming, and for forming, norming, and storming. <laughs> you always go through forming, storming, and norming, right, in your classes, right? Get ready for it. 12 to 18%. Let's, let's, let's go from the middle ground. Let's go 14, right? Let's go 14% because the numbers happen to work reasonably well for us right now. All right, just before this, a couple of hours ago, I went on the global population counter, which is running nonstop online, and we've got 7,153,489,153 and counting. We've got 7 billion people, nearly 7.2 billion people and rising. Let's call it 7 billion. And we've got 317 million in America, 703,207. We've got 300, let's call it 317 million people in this country. You know what we've got to hit? Globally, we've got to hit, more or less, let's average the numbers, we've got to hit a billion people globally. What's that? A billion people doing the PDC? That'd be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> Can we arrange that? Will someone fund that for us? What have you got to do in America? About 43 million. Is there 43 teachers in the room that can hit a million? Is there 43 PDC teachers out there? Is there 43 really active teachers in America that could start adding up that number? How are we going to hit them? How are we going to, you know, I think we maybe hit 1%. Our target audience is that 99%. Who are they? You know, like, how do we do that? How do we get them? I'm teaching 35, 30, 35 at a time on average, made of five courses a year. I'm never going to get there. I'm just not going to get there. Even if each one of those, every one becomes a teacher. You crunch the numbers, you're hardly keeping up. How do we do it? We can do all this imagery. We can do 3D animation and all that stuff that's up there. It's pretty impressive. We can maybe find more people. We can spark some lights. Get some, do you, you, you couldn't, you couldn't imagine how we're going to get there. That's where I realized that it takes some real big risks. With all the work I've done, all the credibility, all the websites I've built up, all the different things that I've had to do, all the things I've put on the line, every ounce of debt that I've gone into, which is everything, every single thing I own is, is, is owned by the bank. I've taken it to the limit just to get to where we can get to as fast as we can get to because it's all that seems that matters. And that's when I started to look into maybe we could do it online. 
maybe. But I, I can't do it unless I do it my way. I mean, it's only one way I can do it. It's just like, have a go. Have a, have a poke at it. Just try. What the hell? Put out the videos, give them away. Everyone was copying my DVDs I was making. It costs quite a lot to make DVDs of that quality. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm sick of this. People just pirating it and you're putting all this work in. So I, I, you can't afford to make any more. So I'm just going to give it all away. I'm going to give all the videos away. I'm just going to make videos and just give them away online. As long as you give me your email address. You can unsubscribe if you don't like what we're doing. I don't care. You can go on and go off. You can give me a false name. You don't even have to put your name in. Just give me your email address and I'll keep sending you free videos. And we'll just keep making them. And then if you like what we're doing, then I'll run a PDC online and see what happens. I had no idea what would happen. I had no idea what it's like to just be a screen agent, but I'm obviously in there too. I mean, I don't want to be in there, but I'm, I'm, I'm really not a techie type person. I, I really much prefer to be outside on the farm, but I feel obliged to keep teaching because I keep getting asked and I keep getting the result. That's all. I wouldn't do it for any other reason. I'd much rather be out there on the land. No question about that. That just makes me a better teacher, unfortunately. So I'm stuck with it, right? Well, I just gave it a go and it exploded. It just went nuts. I couldn't believe what just happened. It just went crazy. I got 10 years worth of students taught in 12 weeks, first time up. How many people in this room took my online course? You all get the next course for free. <laughs> Everybody on the online is a veteran. They get the course for free. You're on for life. As long as I can keep going, you're on. You get it all. <laughs> you can't ask questions. You can answer them. You can ask each other questions and the new students questions but you can't ask the authority questions. You answer them. You get all the new videos. You get all the new, you get all, all the stuff you had before and more, and you get a more streamlined system. You get all those connections. You're the first to know that, unless someone's tweeting to the rest of them. Somebody probably is. Um, as a teacher of design courses, the only thing that, what, the only way you can really tell initially whether you've got a good result from your students is when you set the design exercise, and then you see whether what what mistakes you've made because they're now demonstrated in front of you. And if I see a type one error. I will critique it and, and explain that you can't do that. That's something you just cannot do for whatever reason. But otherwise, I, I don't critique my students. I think it's a wonderfully brave thing. It's not a test. It's an exercise. And I, I, I just, I, you know, I love the fact that people are brave enough to present a design just in any form anyway. But it, 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 it needs to show some proficiency. I'm not super strict, but, you know, people do like to show what they can do after a course. That's the nature of the people in the permaculture movement. And designs generally get better and better and better. I've seen designs over the years get better and better and better and more and more professional. And what I often say to people is what they would be worth in the real world. And it shocks people after a two-week PDC. What a professional st standard you're already at after just 72 hours. Well, I was blown away by the quality of the designs that came in on the online course. 20% of them, I would never be able to do that well. I've never seen design work like that. It was incredible. I was, I still, you know, I could publish a book on those designs alone. Just, you know, and I will put some out because people gave us permission to publish them. 
It was amazing what people came up with. And there's something about the social media that we've ended up in. We've ended up in this social media system where people talk to each other, people communicate with other, each other, people set up help groups within the, within the course, people set up IT support networks, people were in there who didn't know how to use internet mapping and they, they took classes inside the course forum. It went viral inside the course. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. And people got in touch with and said all kinds of things. One lady sold her car to do the course, got three design jobs before the course was finished, and bought a better car. <laughs> Many people said, I'm taking a course. My husband's not interested in permaculture at all. I'm taking a course. My wife's not interested in permaculture at all. They've been looking over my shoulder. They're so interested, they want to pay for the course now. They want to get a certificate, and they're talking about teaching. You've blown me away. This is someone who wasn't interested, because it's in their house, in their time, in their rerun. They can play it again, play it again. What did he say? Play it again. What was that lesson? What was that about? People were saying, their seven-year-olds are debating with them at the breakfast table about the size of swales. <laughs> their three-year-olds and five-year-olds want to replay the video. It's better than Donald Duck. Literally, I've had that. You know, and, and they're saying, can you do permaculture homeschooling videos? Can we use this for homeschooling? <laughs> this is the television. People were saying, they, on the social networking in the forums, people were saying, oh, I'm watching this at work. Then. Hundreds of people said, I'm watching it at work too. <laughs> I thought, I'm undermining the economy. <laughs> you know when most people open their emails in America? Nine o'clock on a Friday morning. Just after nine o'clock on a Friday morning. Google Analytics. Now, not only did they open it, but they clicked the video open too. You can see it all on Google Analytics. Very interesting. People want to watch this at the end of the week, at the start of the last working day of the week. So they're not necessarily happy in what they're doing. They want something different to think about towards the weekend. They want to get boosted. They want to put that weekend they've got into something else. They want to charge at that point. That's why I put the videos out Friday morning. I said, I'm trying to help you. That's why I'm trying to get it up. Like, come on, let's go. This is a really exciting thing to do. Let's do it. We can do this. It's not a problem. The only problem is the people. That's the only problem. And you've got to give the people the information when they can take it. And this is the way they can take it. The people, and, and we know from the records that it's going to, you know, education is going to go online. Maybe we get the numbers that way. Maybe we go viral that way. Maybe we can make the connections that way. I really hope so. I really hope so. I'd really like you to make me redundant. I'd really like you to just take it on, run with it, take it all the way. I'll come back to learn what you've done, that's about it. No other reason. Because we have to push this. We have to push it over that tipping point. You don't need to worry about little finer points. I've lived on solar energy for 20 years on battery bank. I never once wanted to feed back to the grid. I do not want to feed the dinosaur. Do not feed the trolls. Do not feed the main grid. When you're thinking about energy, just look at the car you're driving. You're not driving a car out of the 70s, out of the moon landing era. Those polycrystal panels, they come out of the moon landing. You're driving a modern car. It's a bit different to that period. 
there are better technologies out there. There are better batteries out there. Some of the original nickel-iron batteries, the original Edison battery. There's copper, indium, selenium panels. There's a really good reason that Japan's covering all its factories with copper, indium, selenium. There's, there is good stuff out there. We need to make these moves. It's, it's, it's not about all being perfect tomorrow. It can't be. It's all about us just getting enough people with intention to start moving in that direction. Just start to make that move. When we all start to make that move, we evolve the system together. It's a mass move then. We're going we're gonna to move very quickly as we all start with intention in that direction. We'll get all those refined issues done. That's not a problem. We have incredible ability. That's obviously demonstrated. The biological system, the natural system, all of that stuff on the ground, that's, that, that's just going to jump in our direction every time. You may have heard of the video, you may have seen Green in the Desert. It was the original partnership that I made with my filmmaker that's been with me for 13 years. He, by accident, came and interviewed me and I was kind of angry. I was up on the swale working I got pulled away from my work and I came down and angrily spoke to him about what I'd just been doing in Jordan. And he went away and made this thing called Green in the Desert. And then gave it back to me and said, you know, you like that? And I said, wow. It's amazing. It went around the world, I don't know how many times. Anybody seen it? You know deserts? You know the species in deserts? You know your fruit tree species in deserts? How many people noticed I missed out olives? In Jordan. Just about the national tree. Isn't that funny? message went past the facts actually. Nobody ever picked up I missed out olives. That's an interesting thing. The message was what you wanted to hear. So I've, I've been working with that sort of system ever since. Wanting to get that viral message out. What? I, there was such an accident. I didn't intend that to happen at all. That was just a happy little accident that just shot off and exploded across the internet. But it kept bugging me. How did that happen? How did I do that? That wasn't even intentional. Maybe we could try and do that stuff. Maybe we could make that work. And that's what I've continued to do. And I'll definitely continue to support things like this. This is what has to happen. That's about it from me. Thank you very much.